Hey guys, what's up? In this video, I'm gonna diverge a little bit from my normal content in the sense that I usually make videos for you guys that are students. But in this video, I'm going to actually address teachers and tutors. So what's up people? If you're a teacher or tutor, welcome. I am going to talk today about what some best practices are for creating online educational videos or for teaching online. I know with the whole COVID-19 situation, like our entire country has been flipped upside down. And in a matter of weeks, many of the teachers in America, whether they're tutors or traditional teachers or whoever they are, educators everywhere, we are all stuck trying to move everything online. I've been online for probably the last, oh, five years solidly, almost 90%. So what I thought might be useful in this time would be to share some of the best practices that I've learned through research and experience over the last several years. So hopefully from our background here as a YouTube channel that is constantly pumping out content to try to teach people, we do mostly college admissions and SAT and ACT prep tips. I've scored perfectly about the SAT and the ACT, so I do a lot of like SAT and ACT videos if you haven't watched our channel before. In addition to our YouTube channel, I have a video-based online course for the SAT and the ACT that I've built over the last three years that has like over 100 hours of video content teaching ACT and SAT prep. That's at supertutortv.com if you wanna go see what that is. If you want to, you can follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. We also have a mailing list, supertutortv.com slash subscribe, and you can keep in the loop with everything that we do. I'm also a filmmaker, so that's my other background, is I've co-produced a documentary for public television. I've created digital content for organizations like Stand Up To Cancer and Yahoo. I used to make content for Yahoo's front page. So I also have video production experience. I also Skype tutor or online tutor a lot of students and trial and error has led me to figure some things out that took a little bit of time. So I'm gonna share some of that stuff in this video. What I am not going to talk about in this video, I'm not gonna talk about like what learning management software you should use or what like classroom technology kind of teaching software I recommend because that's probably out of the scope of my expertise and also the kind of things that a lot of times school districts are gonna impose on teachers. The other thing that I'm not gonna get into is all the ins and outs of how to produce awesome video because that took me three years of film school and we probably just don't have time. So I'm not gonna focus on those two things, but I am gonna focus on how do we make content or how do we present ourselves in ways so that students engage more. Cool. One of my favorite studies on online education is a study that came out of MIT by Google Kim and Rubin called an empirical study of MOOC videos in 2014. And what this study found by studying MOOC videos, which are massive online course videos, is what kind of videos and what kind of setups different sort of professors and teachers had that made for more engaging content. So the first thing that I'm gonna talk about is that they recommend that you shoot at a desk and not at a board. As I like to say, a close up is probably more valuable than a wide shot. Effectively, they found that when people were just sitting at a desk and like talking like face to face, it was more engaging, it's more personal than if you're standing up at a blackboard. So I know some of you teachers think, oh, I need to get a camera and I, I should set it up like five feet from the whiteboard so it feels like the kids are in the classroom with me. But when you move to online, it's actually more effective if you just sit at a desk and it's like you're conversational and it's like, hi, here I am. So that's probably good news because it's a lot simpler, I think, than the alternative. Next point is that it is a good idea to intersperse talking heads with slides rather than just have slides alone. I know that there's a very popular type of educational video all over YouTube, like Khan Academy was famous for it when they got started, which is basically you have slides and like a disembodied voice and you like record it on your screen and stuff like that. That kind of teaching is not necessarily the most engaging. And they found that when there was a head, when somebody had video, that that was more engaging, that that was, you know, something that kept people's attention more. So if you are teaching online, I would recommend that you try to intersperse a video with slides, and that can either mean you're cutting back and forth between them or you put them up on the screen at the same time, which is what I generally like to do a lot of the time. And we do that on our online course. Obviously, if you're doing live teaching, you're not gonna be able to edit. You're not gonna be able to like cut between your face and the slide all the time. 
But what you can do is you can try to both screen share and share your video. When it comes to sharing your face in the whiteboard, well, how do you use a whiteboard? Well, let's talk a little bit of software. Like I said, I'm not gonna get too much into software, but there's one piece of software that I use all the time and that's when I screen share. So it's not the, the software I'm using to communicate with everyone, but it's a software I use on my desktop to share my files with people because whatever you're doing, if you're teaching, you're gonna need some sort of software to be able to display whatever learning material it is that you have. And ideally you wanna be able to write on that learning material. There are whiteboards online where you can like go to a web link and share it with a kid and then they can go to that, that whiteboard online and then they have to pull up the whiteboard, you know, address in their web browser at the same time while they video chat with you. There are options like that. I found that it's not as integrated and that the handwriting estimation on them is always terrible. And I've tried lots and lots of different software and my favorite software for presenting information is called Notability. It's around 10 bucks. Nobody from Notability is paying me to say this. It's literally just the best thing that I've found. So how does Notability work and why is it so wonderful? Well, it's not wonderful for its search because its search is kind of not that phenomenal but it's really good for handwriting estimation. And what I mean by that is if I start writing two, four, six, eight, you can actually read my handwriting. It doesn't look like I'm Edward Scissorhands trying to write. And I swear there are so many of these softwares and the handwriting is just so awkward and it's just not cool. So what I do is, is you basically just pull into your files over here. You pull into here, like whatever document it is that you want to write on. I PDF basically everything that I'm going to be teaching from that I can. Um, if I can't do that, then I'm using just the whiteboard function here. So there's my secret here. You can scroll through it. You can write all over it. You can highlight, write. I can color all over it. And this is how I teach. This is just a chapter from my math book. I have two ACT math books, and this is from my second math book, which is sequences and series. So you can see I can pull up like my whole chapter. I can teach kids from it. I can like work problems, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Which brings me to the next point from this study, from this MIT study that they found. They found that freehand sketching was much more engaging than pre-done slides. So that's like another principle of whenever I'm teaching online is I don't want to just use a static slide. I always want to be able to draw all over the place. And even if that means highlighting and scribbling, whatever it is, that natural hand movement like draws people in and it keeps them engaged. And that's important just in terms of education, like to keep people engaged when they're not in the room with you. You definitely want to be like moving your hand, drawing, et cetera, et cetera. And they found that that was more effective with these MOOCs. I know some of you were like freehand sketching. Oh yeah, that's a good idea. I should do that. What pen tablet should I get? I use a Wacom. Medium and Tuos, pen and touch. This is outdated. I don't even think they sell this anymore, which is fine. You don't need the outdated one. You can get the newer one. I think the newer ones are also like Bluetooth. Mine is not Bluetooth. Mine is like cabled. This is a medium. I also have a small. I really like the small. If I did it over again, I might have just gotten the small and not the medium because the medium, you don't need the medium. The small is plenty of space. The Wacom tablets generally are between like $100 and $200. They're a little bit pricey. You don't even need that brand. For the people that we have on staff, we've also gotten just like cheap pen tablets off of amazon.com that are like 20 bucks each, but you gotta get a pen tablet. What's more important I think is the Notability software is gonna be more important than the pen tablet for most people. Last point, another study was done by a couple of guys at USC Newman and Schwartz called Good Sound, Good Research, and it, it basically studied how people perceived things based on the quality of the sound of a video that the information was presented in. And they found that when people use professional quality audio that people believed what they said more. So there's also the idea that you have more authority, the better quality kind of material you're putting out there. I'm not saying everybody needs to go out and get like a professional, like I obviously have like a professional lav mic on right now. You don't have to go to that extent and if you're live teaching, like you can just buy a USB mic. And even if you just buy like a $30 USB mic, you're gonna be stepping up your audio quality a little bit. The other thing that you can do is if you really want to like up the game, you can also get a webcam that's higher quality. And they're not even that expensive. You know, if you get one, even like a $30 webcam, sometimes you can get like a 720p video camera and it can have slightly better audio quality built into that. On YouTube, there's plenty of people who will review lots of those kind of cameras. I don't necessarily have a favorite myself because 
with our high quality video content, we're always using like professional camera gear. So we're kind of like a step above that. But if you're doing like live teaching or something like that, like a webcam is going to be much more practical. You don't need to get a total professional video rig. It's probably overkill. But that's just a quick tip that if you up your game a little bit in terms of gear, that there might be some educational benefit to it. But up to you. I hope you guys like this video. If so, please give it a thumbs up. Subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. And I hope we all get out of this soon. Good luck to everybody. If you've got any questions for me, feel free to shoot them down below. Or if you have any ideas that have worked for you when you're trying to work remotely or teach remotely, let us know. Thanks for watching, guys. I'll see you next time. Stay safe.